All right, so after that great introduction this morning to Matrix Algebra, I have a lot of pointers ahead to Michael. You've got a lot on your plate here. I have a lot, of, a lot of my plate and a lot to live up to, right? So when you have a good introduction, you can only go downhill. So Petros did a nice job sort of uh, providing a background, I guess, on a lot of the basic ideas that have been um, developed over the years, the last 10 or 15 years, on using randomization for matrix computations. Um, so I think it's certainly true that, you know, if, if you think about large data, big data, in any, in any sense of the word. I mean, 2,000 by a half million or something a bit smaller, a bit larger. Um, yeah, as, as Petros and Mike said, you know, I mean, n linear algebra matrix computations are totally bread and butter, right? So having to wrestle with these issues is definitely true. Um, but moreover, I mean, I think that this particular example of randomized algorithms for matrices um, is a particularly nice test case of uh, how to develop algorithmic and statistical methods for large-scale data more generally. And there's a range of reasons for that. Um, so I don't know if Alex is still here, but he gave a good example of that this morning. So he was saying, you know, we want this more general embedding result. We'd like to have um, uh, not an embedding, but sort of an implicit embedding, or I think he called it a computational or algorithmic embedding, such that we have something um, going to Rn. And then he said, but to do the analysis, you know, it's hard to encode bits in Rn and so on, so let's go to the Hamming cube I think he had or something. And that's what really gets, I think, at the heart of, of some of the tensions here, because it's much more natural to think in computer science about things being discrete, because you can encode, you know, solutions to the halting problem or something in, in, in real numbers, right? So how do, you, how do you model computation on the real numbers? And yet, you know, vector spaces are just very, very nice places. Matrices you know, compared to arbitrary metric spaces. I mean, you saw that again and again uh, with Alex. And matrices are just a very natural way to think about data, you know, whether that data comes from scientific applications or, uh, or, or financial applications. I mean, scientific meaning something you know a lot about the generating processes relatively, or internet applications where you don't. They're just, just a nice way to think about and modeling data. And so um, the fact that you're in a vector space buys you a lot. You can get a lot of inferential uh, consequences as a result of that. Um, and it buys a lot algorithmically. I mean, n cubed is, is better than 2 to the n, right? Um, but, but really wrestling with the questions, what does it mean to be good low rank? And so I'll, I'll describe some of these things, but good could mean you want to get the top part of the spectrum, and Petros was describing that. It could mean you want to get the top part of the spectrum and some control on the bottom part of the spectrum, and depending on the particular structural result you use, uh, you either can or cannot do that. If you just hit the matrix with a random projection, typically you don't directly, but maybe it's implicit in the analysis and you don't know you have that. And so I think statisticians and computer scientists and machine learners and, and, and downstream scientists who use this stuff all think about a matrix just in very different ways. And so a lot of the uh, frustrations and successes and failures we've had in bringing some of these ideas to fruition may be a good model, um, you know, if you're serious about thinking about these sort of large-scale issues and sort of the interface between computation and statistics. So Petros talked about the past, a bit of the present. I'll talk about a bit of the present and uh, look forward to maybe some future directions. Uh, here's the roadmap. So we're going to be thinking about, let's call it sketching matrices, and we're, by sampling uh, rows or columns via um, some sort of non-trivial important sampling distribution typically, or via a random projection. And you should think about the random projections not in a more general way like Johnson Lindenstrauss, although that's true, but you should think of that in, in a lot of these applications as essentially rotating you to a random basis where the relevant non-uniformity structures are uniformized. And Petros gave some examples of that that you can sample in some smart way for the matrix products, or you can make that inner sam quote sampling matrix, a sketching matrix dense, essentially a random projection. And if you're familiar with those ideas, you know, those constructions he was giving would give you Johnson Lindenstrauss type results. Um, but it essentially rotates you to a random basis where the non-uniformity structure is nice. And so in particular, there's no large rank one components in that randomly rotated space. Um, and an important theme in a lot of this stuff is in one way or another, you're feeding through matrix multiplication, which is, which is sort of the primitive you should think about that appears lots of times in the analysis. And also the idea of decoupling the randomization from the vector space structure, right? Johnson-Lewis holds just more, much more generally in metric space structures, and it's oftentimes too powerful a hammer 
to get very fine results on these matrix computations. And even as, as he was saying, you know, we've made the theory practice gap a lot less than it has been in the past, but it's still non-trivial. And, and, and to get finer results, you really need to understand the, the uh, vector space structure. And in a sense, getting deterministic or structural results and then applying the randomness much more carefully. And that can be done explicitly in the algorithm or implicitly in the analysis oftentimes gets you much better results. So those are some themes that I'll talk in a little bit more detail about and then show you how um, going forward some of these uh, things may manifest themselves in, in theory and in implementations and in, in machine learning and data applications. So Petro's covered the first uh, four topics, some sort of motivation, matrix multiplication, CX, CUR, projection, low rank approximations, and a range of other things. So I'm going to continue with a few sort of general ideas um, and then I'm going to talk about least squares. And least squares is a nice sort of very simple example, just over-constrained least squares. Um, no regularizations, no fat matrix, I mean just, just the simplest thing you can imagine. And, um, and show you sort of why these algorithms work. And this is going to be an algorithmic perspective, meaning here's the data and chew on it. You know, call your black box and I want an answer here. And most of the results um, that Petra's describing, that I'll be describing, adopt that perspective basically. Um, and although the randomness is inside the algorithm, you might imagine that you know, the randomness might denoise the data in some way and so you might get improved statistical results. So in a lot of cases, we, you do see that. You, know, you get some regularization properties. Um, why that's the case is just starting to, I think, be understood. Um, and so I'd like to describe a little bit sort of a statistical perspective on least squares, where now you say, I have a model, I'm doing least squares because the model is the, quote, right thing to do, and I want to get such and such result. And this will highlight, I think, some of the differences between the two approaches. And um, one's not uniformly better than the other, but they offer slightly different perspectives. And then um, go back to machine learning kernels, symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, where you're not as rectangular. You know, you have a, a, a large matrix. In this case, it'll be a, a kernel, if you know what that is. Um, and this will be in large with a lowercase l. You know, so not huge, but large enough that the sampling and projection algorithms will give non-trivial results, but small enough that we can do full computations to compare and, uh, and see how things behave. And I'll not go into much of the empirical results, but I'll, I'll give you a few examples of, of what I'm talking about. And then maybe um, some theory and practice of implementing these ideas in much larger scale settings. So I'm going to talk just about L2 regression. And I think I have one slide summarizing L1 regression. Um, the same ideas will go through there. That's what Petros was talking about. We can, we can do least absolute deviations. So the thing Gauss would have done had he been able to do that. But he put a square and you know, did Gaussian elimination and so on and did least squares regression. And so that's the thing that people do because they can. So we, we can do least absolute deviations to regression to moderate precision, you know, three digits, four digits, five digits of precision on a terabyte of data. Um, and at, at a high level, you use the same ideas that Petros was talking about. There's a theory practice gap. And at a slightly lower level, there's, there's a lot of interesting um, practical questions and a lot of interesting theoretical questions. I mean, what's a, what's a good way to think about large data that's not in RAM? Is the streaming model that people have th you know, thought about in the theory of algorithms quite the right way to do it? Or is it more appropriate to have some other type of model? And then those, won't, we won't give you answers today, but those will be a lot of the things we'll revisit. So randomized algorithms, why? So in some cases, you just get faster, worst case results. Here's your input. I want worst case guarantees. I want to be faster. Sometimes you get simpler algorithms. If you know the details of numerical code, it's pretty complex. You have pivot rule decisions, lots of if statements, check this. Th lots of times you just get simpler algorithms. You know, why is that? I mean, maybe the randomness fuzzes stuff out a little bit, and so you're a little bit less sensitive to the details of pivot rule decisions. Um, maybe a range of other things. You, you know, the randomness might give you better condition number properties, so in certain cases you might actually even be able to form the normal equations and so on. So a lot of times you get simpler algorithms. More interpretable output. So in my experience, this is something that machine learners People who would self-identify as machine learning don't particularly care about. They just say, get a feature vector, plug it into some system, run with it. The CX thing that Petros was talking about. In my experience, downstream scientists, geneticists, you know, astronomers, you know, chemists, you know, people that work on, on, on neural imaging, for them, the interpretability is paramount. And so getting actual columns really matters a lot to them. Understanding where these things came from. And so you saw an example of that. We had chose a small number of actual SNPs rather than a small number of eigen SNPs. The implicit regularization properties. I'm not going to have a lot to say about that. We've characterized it in certain different settings, and, and I'll allude to some of the empirical evidence, that, but not go into detail about it here. But as I said, although the randomness is inside the algorithms, you have a worst case guarantee. In certain cases, you'll get smoother and nicer um, uh, answers in, in a way that sort of empirically is what regularization will do. You can exploit modern computer architectures in, cer in certain cases by reorganizing the steps of the algorithm. 
um, better communication properties in particular. And that's going to be very important for going to large scale settings. Um, and if you have the data stored in sort of external devices. So already a big story, but why do they work? Uh, already a big success story. Sort of why do they work? What, what makes them work? So Petrus described some of these things, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. But first of all, um, I think the best single afternoon I spent in the last 10 years was when I was at Docstool with Sivan Toledo, and we had lunch, and he said, wow, Michael, that was an interesting talk, because um, I was talking about the least square stuff and some other things that I'll be talking about. But this stuff's just never useful. Theory of algorithms, people were excited about this eight years ago, and it wasn't useful. And I, said, I sat down with Sivan at, at lunch, and I said, um, you know, I don't know whether or not it's going to be useful. You know, my PhD was actually in computational statistical mechanics, so I'd code eight hours a day before I got into this stuff. And I said, all the reasons why the, the previous generation wasn't successful, it, it's clear if you've done much implementation why they're not going to be. And all those things are addressed here. And so maybe there'll be something else that pops up and surprises us, but um, all, all those reasons that it's not useful in practice, we've addressed. And so we talked for five hours. It was going to be 15 minutes at you know, 1 to 1.15 or something. And five hours later, it was 6 o'clock, and we went to dinner. And eight months later, I got a manuscript on my desk that started out with saying, um, and this is not you know, a theory of algorithms person saying, although the Siva knows a lot of theory of algorithms, but he knows a lot of scientific computing, saying randomization is arguably the most exciting and innovative idea to hit linear algebra in a long time. Blend and pick the code that they, do, you know, the, the a code that they developed in that paper beats LA packs direct dense least squares solver. So this isn't some esoteric problem. This is just bread and butter. Direct dense least squares problem by a large margin on essentially any tall dense matrix. So it's one thing to sort of do. Um, theory that's sort of motivated or might be useful. It's another thing to go head to head with LA pack, if you know what that is. It's been optimized to death over the years and beat it on essentially any tall dense matrix. And the empirical results show the potential of random sampling algorithms and suggest that random projections should be incorporated into future versions of LA pack. So a remarkable claim on the uh, applied side for big success. So better worst case theory, Petrus gave you some examples of that. Implementations beat LA pack. A lot of the low rank implementations are better. So better in the sense that they might be simpler to implement. Um, in some cases, they run faster. In some cases, they're just more robust to details of the discretization of the grid if you're doing PDE computations or other things like that. Parallel and distributed implementations, I'll get back to that, and a lot of scientific applications. So why do these things work? So to sort of understand why they work or why they didn't immediately work or why there's a bit of a cultural disconnect, this is the result Petros put up earlier, but I put it in a little bit more detail. And the form of the result that you'd see in a lot of papers will be something like, let T sub SVD sub K time be the time to compute an exact or approximate rank k approximation to the uh, SVD. If you're a numerical analyst, you're probably already getting a little bit anxious here. Um, then, given an arbitrary m by n matrix, there exists an algorithm. So for all you know, you know this is some uh, existential result. We can't even write the algorithm down. Um, that runs in order t, so we're having a constant there, SVT time, that picks at most roughly 3,200 k over epsilon squared log k over epsilon columns such that with probably at least 0.9, you get that result that he had up earlier. So, you know, what is that? That's certainly sufficient. A lot of people will think it's necessary. It's not, but, you know, that's some amount of time. There exists an algorithm. Typically, in algorithms, you put the algorithm, it, it's a, you, know, you may have a constructive proof inside the proof. You, you basically construct it. That's what's going on here, but that's not the way numerical analysts would think about it. 3,200 is the total artifact of the analysis. This was propagated to a lot of subsequent papers that other people have done. But if you just look at it, that's a total artifact of the analysis. But people get upset about that and a little bit concerned. And the epsilon squared, you know, I want 10 to the minus 10. That epsilon squared is going to kill me. Right? So in a lot of cases, if epsilon is 1 or 0.1, you just sample an over fa extra factor of 10 or, or, or k plus 10, you actually do very well. If you want to drive epsilon very far down, you're going to get a law of large number of effects, and you're not going to be able to do that. And so if you're going to want that, you're going to have to couple with an iterative algorithm. We'll get back to that. Such that with probability 0.9, you run this you know, 10 times in parallel, keep the best. This will fail with probability 0.0001. But you know, th it's not stated that way. So why do these algorithms work? And, and essentially, the algorithms work because they decouple the randomness from the vector space structure. So you saw an example of this with the CX and CUR decomposition that we'll Petros described. Also to describe what's going on in the hood in terms of least squares approximations. Because choosing good columns, you know, with unitarily invariant norms, you can believe boils down to something like least squares. Um, column subset projection. What if I want to go from k log k to exactly k columns? So this was on the slides Petros had, but he didn't go into the details. But if you get a slightly stronger structural result that he actually described, 
If you have a different algorithm, I want to do a random projection and parameterize it such that I keep k plus 10, the analysis boils down to the, exactly the same thing, which in many cases boils down to matrix multiplication result. What if you want to work with machine learning kernels, symmetric positive semi-definite matrices? So you might think that if you have a result for a general matrix, it's going to work for a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. Right? So what's going to be a problem there? So in most applications where you get symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, the symmetry and positive definite is very important because you're not trying to get a low rank approximation. You're feeding this into some classification system and it's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space structure under the hood. And so you want to preserve the symmetry and positive definite. Most of the other algorithms don't do that. And that's in general going to be hard to do, right? Unless the matrix is diagonally dominant or something where you have an easy check on that. So how do you do that? And so, you know, you can do that if you do this decoupling, and I'll describe that. So this provides much finer control in the application of the randomization to get better worst case theory, easier to map to machine learning and statistical ideas. People that think about parameterizing the problems slightly differently, and I'll give you a couple examples of that, and parameterize in ways that are easier to implement. In some cases, this is in the analysis, and if you look at the theory of algorithms paper, lots of times this is buried in the analysis, but it's buried there because the structural properties per se don't matter, you just want a fast algorithm. Um, now, there's a number of examples of this, but the simplest example, and historically the first, was these statistical leverage scores that Petrus mentioned, and I'll describe this in the context of least squares. And the interesting thing about this is w the statement of the results he had, the statement of the first result I'll be doing is, we're going to run an algorithm. Here's your data. I'm not saying that least squares is the right or wrong thing to do. Just run an algorithm on this. And the key non-uniformity structure that you need to get a handle on is something that we backed out of the analysis, but then we found out has a very, very natural statistical interpretation in terms of regression diagnostics and outliers. And so this is a nice example of, um, and, and, and you see these same sorts of structures coming out if you do a statistical analysis on least squares or kernel least squares. So this is a nice example of there's certain structures here, and if you have good control over them, you can get good algorithmic properties if you ask this question, good statistical properties if you ask that question, or play the two against each other if you really want to get large scale. So the best sampling algorithms essentially use these as an important sampling distribution, and the best projection algorithms rotate to a random basis where they're roughly uniform. And you really need to couple with uh, the, the domain experience, and that's true whether or not you do genetics and astronomy or numerical implementations and so on. Okay, so the leverage was, so, so let's, uh, except for the symmetric positive definite matrices I'll be talking about, everything else will be tall. Let's just go with vanilla least squares, over-constrained, over-determined, so different areas use uh, different words to describe this, but let's say that you have an n by d matrix A. n is large, d is small, so it's tall. n is greater than d. And let's let u be any orthogonal matrix spanning the column space of A. So it could be q from qr, it could be u, the left singular vectors, it could be anything. And let's let u sub i be the ith row of u. So Petra's is describing it in terms of so he was sampling columns because he was doing the matrix problem. So he was working on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Here, I'll be working on the left-hand side. All right? So let's let u sub i be the ith row of u, right? So the columns are unit length and orthogonal to the rows or not. And the rows can be anything, right? If it's a Hadamard matrix or a Gaussian with reasonable density, the row lengths are all going to be uniform, roughly or exactly. A different orthogonal matrix could be an identity up here with all zeros, in which case they're very non-uniform, all right? And the tricky thing is, if you're in the non-uniform case, not that trivially non-uniform, but more generally, the hard part for sampling algorithms is finding these things. And if you're more familiar with signal processing or something, you should think of this as something like a delta function. And what happens when you hit a Fourier transform against a delta function? Right, you go from something that's very localized at a single spot to very delocalized. That's what random projections do. They take the localized structure in the coordinate biased sense and delocalize it over all the coordinates. So the statistical leverage scores are the Euclidean norms of these rows of u. I've defined it in terms of a particular u, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because those are the diagonal elements of the projection matrix under the column span of A. All right, so any orthogonal matrix will, will work. The coherence you might be more familiar with. A lot of problems are parameterized in terms of coherence. The coherence is the largest leverage score. Sometimes it's the largest off-diagonal element, but it's the largest le leverage score. And you can have cross terms. And there's going to be extensions of this to fat matrices when um, you know, the matrix is not very rectangular, but you have a low rank parameter. There'll be low rank extensions to LP and other norms and so on. So, but this is the vanilla version, right? So tall matrix, diagonal and projection matrix. Um, and so th this is, you want to bridge the gap, right, between theory and practice and algorithms and statistical for large scale data analysis. So back in about 2005 or something, there was a range of additive error algorithms.
additive error in the sense that if you do a sampling or projection, you'd be better than the best rank K plus epsilon, where epsilon is very large. And actually, if, if this, a lot of this work that I'll be talking about grew out of theory of algorithms and convex geometry and a lot of the stuff we're hearing about here. But if you asked people back in 2005 what they thought of this line of work, I mean, was it interesting, useful, or whatever, if you asked anyone inside theoretical computer science and convex analysis, they'd say, I mean, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, we have fast algorithms, there's lower bounds. I mean, there's lower bounds, you can't do better than additive error algorithms, done, and wonderful. If you ask anyone basically outside theoretical computer science, they would say either they had never heard of it if they're being generous, or they would say they, it was useless, period. So, so why is that, and why was there such an egregious disconnect? And now if you're eight years later, why is it the case that in fact the original work con contained a bunch of gems of ideas, but it certainly wasn't directly useful? And so now you have, as I described, you know, machine learning and statistics and numerical applications. You have fast versions of random projections, relative error much stronger, numerically stable algorithms, you do these computations on literally a terabyte of data. And basically the way we bridge that gap was by decoupling the randomness from the linear algebra, and the simplest example is these leverage scores. So before I get to that, um, Petros put up an example of genetics data, applications in astronomy. Um, astronomy generates gobs and gobs of data. And um, typically they have a telescope, looks up at the sky, and takes lots of pictures, right? And so you'll see something like this. Here's, um, here's uh, continuum emission. This is a as a function of frequency, something having to do with flux density. And this is something about the general background, and you'll typically see spikes. And these spikes are either absorption or emission lines, and they say roughly that you, know, you have a given thing going on that's doing something interesting. You, know, you have a star that's you know, oscillating in a certain way, you have a star at a certain point in its, the evolution of its life, you have a galaxy with certain properties, you'll get dips or spikes here and there. And so an applied question that's of interest to them is, do these computations faster? Because they you know, get 10,000 by million matrices you know, all the time, 10,000 by 100 million matrices. And a different question is, can we select informative frequencies? And the reason you want informative frequencies is because this frequency means a lot you know, in terms of nuclear synthesis in the stars. There means you know, an awful lot in terms of redshift properties. It means a lot in, in terms of the physics of the problem. And what they'll oftentimes do is pull out the first principal components and you get an average spectrum. And the second, you get some stellar continuum. The third, finer continuum plus age, and then you know you tell lots of stories because it's just very hard to interpret beyond the first couple eigenvectors. We're in, think of this as 1 to 4,000 or 4,000 to 9,000, so there's 5,000, you're in R5,000, and I want to choose the most interesting directions in that vector space, the, the 10 most interesting um, columns. That's the spectrum, those are the principal components, the first five. Oh. Yeah. All right, so let me talk about algorithmic approaches to least squares. I'll get back to this um, astr astronomical example in a little bit. So, tall matrix, and you want to minimize, uh, you want to solve that in some sense. So if you're tall, in general, there's not a solution, right? B has a piece sitting outside the column space of A, so there's not a solution. So what you ask for is the best such X. And you know, a standard thing to do is to put a two norm, best in the sense of Euclidean norm. So you're dealing with overconstrained LP, in this case P equals two regression problems. This appears everywhere. A very natural statistical interpretation in terms of a best linear unbiased estimator. Natural geometric interpretation, you take the vector and project it down to the span of the columns of A and so on. And so an algorithmic question is how long does it take to solve this problem? And the short answer is it takes n times d squared time. So you can use direct and iterative methods and there's a number of other subtleties there, but let's gloss over that. Um, at this point, but you know, you can use Cholesky or QR singular value decomposition, but think of it as taking high dimension times low dimension squared time. So that's the thing you want to beat. And, and the, you know, that's the, there's not a lot of wiggle room, right? You need to touch the high dimension, your quadratic and the low dimension. A different uh, question is, you know, you might want to model with least squares and say, when is this the right thing to do? A more algorithmic, a statistical perspective. And roughly it's when the relationship between the outcomes and predictors is, is roughly linear. And the error term is nice. So you think of you know, A as being such that uh, B, the right-hand side, is equal to AX, where X is the optimal, plus epsilon, where epsilon is some error, and say it's Gaussian or something else. But if it's Gaussian or, or nice enough that large uh, sample theory will hold, um, then this will go through. So mean zero, constant variance, uncorrelated, roughly normal. And so, you know, the prudent data analyst or machine learner will check whether these assumptions have been violated or how egregiously they've been violated, right? And so how do you do that? So you say B is equal to AX plus noise, 
and you say the optimal vector x is equal to a transpose a inverse times a transpose b, that's what we computed a couple days ago, that, a couple slides ago, that's n times d squared time. And b, the right hand side, this is a hat, if you're familiar with hats, I couldn't get a hat in PowerPoint so I put a prime there, so it's a hat on the front of the head. b prime is equal to hb. So h is equal to a times a transpose a inverse times a transpose. That's just a complicated way of writing u times u transpose. It's just the projection matrix onto the column space of a. And in very precise senses, a lot of work in regression diagnostics, it says hij measures the influence or leverage exerted on the ith prediction by the jth data point. Interestingly, it's regardless of the value of b, since it only depends on a. And so the diagonal elements in some sense measure the importance or influence of a given data point. Um, the trace of h is equal to d, the low dimension. Diagnostic rule of thumb, if the diagonal elements are larger than two or three times the average value, flag it. You know, maybe it's an outlier. Maybe you kicked the machine when you generated the data. Empirical fact in a wide, wide range of data sets, you, know, you have a huge number of data points that are a factor of 10 or 20 or 50 larger than the average. And those are not mistakes. Those are the most interesting data elements. And those are the outlying SNPs. Those are the SNPs that are most important for the classification axes. Those are the, um, the frequencies that are most interesting to the astronomers. And so you might ask, why is it the case that um, in a lot of applications, this thing that should be pretty uniform if, if you're doing things quote right statistically is just very, very non-uniform. And the answer is if you think about the SNPs, there's no reason to think that you know, L2 or anything like that should hold, right? I mean, there's nothing Gaussian about that. Each SNP is a single event in human history. It works its way back with population mixing, but, but then you have a lot more SNPs. So there's nothing Gaussian about that, right? So you're using an L2 computation because you can. And even then you're going to have trouble if you're doing it on a 10,000 by million matrix, right? And, but anything more expensive is going to be can't. So you're using a computation that has implicit assumptions that you know are wrong. And so it's not surprising that there's going to be things that stick out by that measure. So here's a, ran here's a vanilla. If you understand this algorithm, um, you'll understand, you know, 90% of the stuff that's going on in um, these randomized matrix algorithms. And this algorithm is nice because if you, if you understand it, what I said is the case, you'll understand 90% of everything else. But if you want to adopt a different perspective and just say how does it compare sort of on its own merits, this is an algorithm that's going to be no faster than a black box that I had up a couple slides ago. It's in fact going to be epsilon worse in terms of the objective function quality, and it might fail with probability delta. So no faster, going to be worse, might fail. So it doesn't seem much to recommend itself. Um, but I want to go through this in detail because all those problems can be solved. And if you understand this, this is going to be an engine for everything that else that follows. So we want to solve the overconstrained least squares problems. The solution is a pseudo inverse times b. That's just another way of writing the same thing. I put up a slide. Simple algorithm. For all i and 1 to n, the high dimension, compute the diagonal elements of that projection matrix. So we only need a single score, right? We don't actually need that, that orthogonal matrix, but I told you to compute it. But compute that, for example, by doing a QR and then reading off the row lengths. But maybe you can do it faster. Randomly sample something like d log d over epsilon rows and elements from a and b, using this as an important sampling distribution. So bias yourself towards these things. If those are uniform, sample uniformly. If those are very non-uniform, sample non-uniformly. Solve the subproblem. How do you solve the subproblem? Call a black box, whichever one of those things I had up a few pages ago that you like. Call in MATLAB or LAPAC. Call your favorite black box. All right? So define a non uniformity structure, subsample based on that, solve the subproblem. You can ask about iterating, lots of things, some of the stuff in terms of structural properties I'll get to. We'll describe some of those things, but the simplest version is just one step. Define the non uniformity structure, pull out a bunch of rows here, elements, solve the subproblem. So theorem, gamma is a fudge factor, don't worry about that. If you do that, then both on the objective function and on the vector or certificate achieving that, you have very strong relative error. So this is the more common thing in theory of algorithms, just look at the objective function. Usually you're going to use the certificate, which you might not even compute for more general graph algorithms, but for these machine learning and, and matrix algorithms, you, you typically get that almost, almost automatically. And oftentimes you're more interested in the certificate because you don't really care about the objective function. You don't care about a unitarily invariant norm. You're going to feed that vector to some classification problem or something. So you'd like good control on that. But both on the objective function, you take x opt, the solution to the subproblem, feed it back into the objective. You're within 1 plus epsilon of z. That's the optimum. And on the certificate, you're root epsilon times a condition number. So very strong relative error approximation in both senses of the word. Naive algorithm runs in n times d squared time, but it can be improved. And this is the bottleneck, as, as I'll point out for the things Petrus was talking about earlier. So 
here's a sufficient condition to get 1 plus epsilon. There's your, one, there's your epsilon relative or approximate. Here's a sufficient condition. Let's let x be any pre-processing matrix. So remember what we're doing here. We have ax. We're saying that um, ax, a is tall, is close to b. And we're operating on the left-hand side because we're doing a sampling operation. We might do a projection operation. Um, and, and when you're operating on the left-hand side, you're working on the rows. So let's let x be the sampling operation or the projection operation. Or more generally, let x be anything. All right, deterministic, randomized, one pass, iter let x be anything. Then for any pre-processing matrix x, if sigma min, the smallest singular value of x times u, u are the left singular vectors of, of the matrix, is greater than a half, in particular bounded away from zero. And if u times x transpose times x times b perp, b perp is the part of b sitting outside the column space. So u times b perp is zero. If u transpose times x transpose times x times b perp is approximately zero, if it's less than epsilon times z squared, then you get those relative error bounds. Now these um, are important because this is a structural condition that decouples the randomness from the linear algebra. There's no deterministic statement here. If x can be constructed with some randomized mechanism, great. And if not, do something deterministic. If you do a deterministic thing and you can check after the fact in an a posteriori manner, worst case algorithms, people might not like that, but you may have a better result in practice. Right? In particular, random sampling algorithms with leverage score probabilities and random projection algorithms will satisfy that. Now, how does this relate to what Petros was talking about earlier? In particular, the matrix multiplication results. Does this have anything to do with matrix multiplication? So if the answer is no, I'm just pausing to have a bit of water. So the answer is yes. So the question is how? So U is an orthogonal matrix. And it's tall. Remember, U is A is tall, so the left singular vectors are tall. U transpose U is a low dimensional identity. All right? Let's look at I, the identity, minus U transpose X transpose XU. And so the question is, how far is that from an identity? So eigenvectors and singular vectors behave in strange ways. Then you can swing 90 degrees and so on. But a reasonable notion of closeness to an identity is that the spectral norm of this matrix is less than a half, or strictly less than one. You know, if it's strictly less than one, then you preserve rank. So let's just say it's bounded away from one. So call it a half. If it's less than a half, that's where you get the square root there. Um, then you preserve rank. But this is just an approximate matrix multiplication result. I mean, this is A, B. That's A, B, where B happens to equal A. All right? And that's exactly the spectral norm bound. So Petros had an ep we had an epsilon here before. You could have a norm of uh, a Frobenius norm of A or B, depending on how it was set up. He had an epsilon before because he absorbed that into the sampling complexity. Um, and what's the, no what's the Frobenius norm of U? U is an orthogonal matrix. What's the Frobenius norm of U? It's not the high dimension. It's not n. It's d. So you call that epsilon, epsilon times d, and absorb d into the sampling complexity. Call that epsilon. You're done. So that first condition is a matrix multiplication result. Call that as a black box. What about the second condition? That's the first condition. The second condition. So 0 is a matrix is u transpose b perp, right? Because b perp is perpendicular to u. 0 minus u transpose x transpose x b perp. Frobenius norm. This is a. This is b. The matrix b now is a vector. That's fine. Frobenius norm is the Euclidean norm in that case. Is less than epsilon times what? So to get this result, remember before in the, in the matrix sampling result, we needed to sample with respect to the row norms of A and the row norms of B. And in that case, you get the cleanest results. That's what we heard before. 
if you sample with respect to the row norms of just one matrix or the other, run through the analysis, you get similar results. Oftentimes the concentration's worse, sometimes you get you know, something that's a little bit worse. If you have a bound on um, the elements of B or something, then results will go through. In this case, what is B? So say we sample based on only information in A, in A meaning the left singular vectors. What is B perp? So B perp, the norm of B perp is the scale of the error we're worrying about. All right? The norm of B perp is, is one of these things. It's that thing. It's a scale. It's the amount of mass sitting outside the column space of A. So we just eat that. So it's epsilon times the norm of the Frobenius norm of U, which is uh, K or what am I doing? D root D times B perp, and that's you get those results. So this is a matrix multiplication result. Get a nice structural result characterization here. Call matrix multiplication black box done. All right. So, yeah. Well, so what do I mean? I'll, I can give you a couple examples. It's not that you should understand that. Um, I'd like to make statements. I'd like to apply what I don't want to do, because you just get results that are too coarse. Is think of this as a, as a random projection, Johnson Linden's dress, and just whack it. I mean that works in any metric space. If you apply it in RN, you're going to do a lot of damage, because it's a much more structured place. So you can do that, and in fact, if you do that with a random projection, and you close your eyes, you get out of error bounds. It's only years later that people went back and looked inside the analysis. And said, Geez, in fact, you can get much better results. And it was only after in the column sampling we said, what's the basic structure results in the vector space that's going to be sufficient to get good bounds? And what if we apply randomness right there? And sometimes that's done in the algorithm. Use smart sampling probabilities rather than dumb sampling probabilities. And, and you, you apply it in, inside the algorithm, meaning inside the algorithm you have to compute those probabilities. It could be inside the analysis. Do a random projection. And at this step of the analysis, I say, um, I'm going to bound this thing in a smart way or this thing in a coarser way. So if you just view it in terms of, I, I think, in terms of a johnson linus type result, you, you're going to get much coarser results than if you understand the vector space structure. And so, and so what I mean is I want to get su sort of sufficient conditions that are deterministic, that don't have any statement about randomness. And then I want to show that for certain classes of random matrices, sampling or projection there, I get good results. So there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. One, if you're just interested in worst case bounds, it's, it's a cleaner MO in, in, in terms of trying to get that. Two is, you know, what if I don't want to sample, you know, uh, what am I calling it, D? What if I don't want to sample D log D over epsilon? What if I want to sample D plus 10? If I have a way to check whether those are satisfied, then I can sample D, get D plus 10. And if the answer is yes, done. If the answer is no, choose another 10. And so it's, it's a way, doing this, it's a way to parameterize the problems in cleaner ways that's, that are going to be more amenable to numerical analysis and to statistical analysis and to the way people outside algorithms formulate problems. So does that, does that make sense? So, so this is one example. I'll give you another example a couple slides later, and let's talk offline. I mean, it, it is, it's not a precise statement. It's, it's, it's an informal statement, but this is an example of it, and I'll give you a couple, another example in a couple slides. But I want... I, want I guess my problem is that I don't see the larger picture. I mean, I don't see... The, I don't have the prerequisites for... <coughs> like you want to decouple in, in, the, in the results or in the order. Could be either. If, if I do a projection, oftentimes it's inside the analysis. If I do a sampling, it's in the results. It's, 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 sorry, it's in the algorithm. So if I do a projection, it's, did I say that right? If I do a projection, it may be inside the analysis. So, so, so for example, to get the additive error bounds that I alluded to before, what was done in, you know, 15 years ago is sample according to the Euclidean norms of the rows of A. Or you could do a random projection and apply johnson lindenstrass basically on the rows of A. And you got additive error bounds in both cases. Now I could also say, what if I sampled in, in a more sophisticated way based on the leverage scores? Now do johnson lindenstrass basically on those things, the rows of the right or left singular vectors. So now it's, it's inside the algorithm, because I've had to sample in a different way. If I do a random projection, the algorithm is exactly the same. Do a random projection. But now inside the analysis, I say, geez, don't apply johnson lindenstrass on the rows of the matrix, but apply johnson lindenstrass on the rows of the right or left singular vectors. So this is buried inside the analysis. But, but the same thing's going on. Um, for the 
regression case, no, but one could. Um, because it, we can guarantee it and so on and so forth. For the low rank case, the answer is yes. So the, some of the good high quality numerical implementations won't sample, in that case, if you have a rank parameter, k log k, um, but they'll, 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 um, they'll sample k plus 10. And then they'll have a check to say, did I preserve rank? And so and a way to do that is to check to a rank revealing QR or something. So, so they, those implementations uh, do, in fact, check the generalization of these conditions. In the analysis, if I can, if I can pr show that this is the case, then I'm done. And one, it, one way to do this would be choose a randomized algorithm, namely choose a random x, a random mapping x, and show that I satisfy that with high probability. So lemma, if you satisfy this, you get relative error. That's lemma one. Lemma two, random samplings with the leverage scores, random projection satisfies that. Combine them, done, yeah. So this is just a deterministic statement independent of any randomness that talks about how the sketching operator interacts with the vector space structure. Just yeah. I understand it's not necessary, but can you argue that most known algorithms for approximating this at some point are the useless condition? Um, so to the extent that I can understand some of the papers, yes but it's oftentimes buried deep in the analysis. And if you ask the people who wrote those papers, they'll say yes, but it's not exactly clear where in the analysis. So in a sense, this is just clarifying something that I think on the algorithm side, people just don't worry about. Because the goal is not to understand these properties per se. The goal is just a fast algorithm and just bury it all in the analysis. But um, in, I, I don't know of an exception to it, but in most or all cases, something like this is buried in the analysis. But I mean, it, it, that's one of the things that makes it impenetrable to people one step removed from algorithms. But um, I think so, yeah. So can you just give a little bit more interpretation of the intuition of the second, uh, the second condition? What that mean? Is we try to project it is to some space. So, so essentially what we're doing here, this is a high dimensional space. It's n dimensions. And I want, I mean, there's an, you know, you, you can define a notion of an angle between two lines. You can define an a, a notion of an angle between two subspaces. And um, what this is saying is that if you dot u into itself, you know, things exactly align in nice ways and you get exactly an identity. You know, all the singular values are one. What this says is if I, if I take this, u, I mean, th think of this in terms of numbers, right? If you have a million numbers, um, and you sample from them, then you know if, if the variance isn't too bad, you sample a couple hundred, you get a good estimate. I mean, this is saying exactly that, right? If this is a matrix multiplication result, this is just saying exactly that. But in terms of the vector space structure, you're, if you write these out as rank one operators, then you can think of each of these things as mapping to a particular component in the high dimensional space. And so what we're doing, we're sampling a small number of rows, you know, constraints, um, and we're saying that we're going to do sort of a rotation from the n dimensions and we're not just doing some arbitrary rotation up in n dimensions. We're doing a rotation in n dimensions that goes down here and zeroes out the vast majority of things. But that rotation that zeroed out the vast majority of things has a small angle. So preserving rank is basically saying that the angle between the two subspaces is small. So I'm here. I rotate in a very careful way that zeroes out most of the things. And that angle is small in the high dimensional space. And that's the interpretation of both. But in particular, the latter. Yeah. All right, um, so I told you, don't worry about the fact that it, the algorithm's n times d squared time and all these sorts of things. Why? Um, so this is a basic structure result. So the question is, how do you, what do you want to do with this? And what you want to do with this really depends on whether you're in RAM, whether there's flops, whether you're optimizing flops, whether you're optimizing something in parallel distributed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you want to optimize things in RAM, if you want to be fastest in terms of just flop count, operation count, you can use a fast random projection. And by that, I mean basically a Fourier or Hadamard type structured random projection. So the first example was Allian and Chazelle when they were interested in um, uh, 
um, a problem related to this, and um, Silas applied it to the least squares problem, and a whole bunch of other people have followed up on that. And it's, you should think of this as, as something like a Gaussian random projection, or plus or minus one random projection, but it's structured, so you can take advantage of fast Fourier techniques. And in particular, you can apply it in n log d time, roughly. So not n, d, n log d, and there's an extra factor of d to take care of every, every uh, column. And so roughly it's n d log d time. So do a random projection in roughly n d log d time, faster than n d squared, solve the subproblem. Or call an algorithm to approximate the leverage scores. That's a black box. I'll get to that in a few slides. The bottleneck in that black box is a random projection, which takes exactly the same time, n d log d time. So fast random projection, pre-processed with this fast Hadamard-based random tr transform. That rotates to a random basis of the leverage scores, a uniform sample uniformly done. Solve the subproblem. Or compute 1 plus epsilon approximations with a black box I'll describe in a little bit, the running time of which is a random projection. Solve the subproblem. If you do either of those, you get 1 plus or minus epsilon approximations. In nd, I said log d. It's in fact nd log of d log n over epsilon plus d cubed in lower order terms. All right. This is good if you want epsilon to be 0.1. Not if you want epsilon to be 10 to the minus 10. If you want epsilon to the 10 to the minus 10, I guess I don't have it. Basically, you take that sketch you did, rather than that feed that to a black box that sub solves the subproblem, use that as a preconditioner. Call a traditional iterative method. All right, use it as a preconditioner. You get a well-conditioned system. You don't need to iterate too much. So that's um, what Blend and Pick did. Blend and Pick is um, the quote that I put up earlier. And I'll talk about how to do that same sort of idea in a in parallel or distributed environments, and that's LSRN. Um, okay, can go to the one? Yeah. The before this. Must be an algorithms guy that loves a bound like this, right? This is going to be make up. I know. I know. So what makes you think we can get these are the evidence that you can get a faster result? You can. So what's I can replace that with constant times number of non-zeros. 50 times, 10 times number of non-zeros. So given that n is the largest, large term than b, right? I'll, n's I'll, large. I'll, I'll, I would still like to get something that's sort of linear in n and then, uh, then on the d terms. So if co the number of non-zeros has to be linear in n or you have rows that are zero. Linear in n, b. Number of non-zeros is better than n, d. Yeah, but it's more than n. It's more than n. So n, d by number of non-zeros in the matrix, I understand. I'm, I'm Term, which is like just function of n, and then some uh, additional terms in, in polynomial, high polynomial. You want, what do you want to do? Remove this log? So, so the Clarkson Woodruff result that the, the drawing already extended so on, I mean, does this in, in sparsity. So that's the constant times number of non zeros. But you're asking something different. You're saying that nd, for example, I don't need n times d, right? I can replace it by number of non zeros. Yeah. <coughs> We don't know how that feeds iter iterators and so on, but the sh but yeah, I mean that's 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 currently theoretic result. We and others, I think Petros has an implementation. We have something, but and it performs well. We haven't done high precision, but yes, we can replace that with constant times number non zeros. Um, feed it to an iterative algorithm. I'll mention later, you know, um, roughly how you do it. But if you understand the basic idea we have here. Depending on time, I can go through that in 10 minutes or one. And you'll understand the basic idea, even if I do it in one, if you understand the basic idea we've done so far. So is it clear to everyone what we've done so far? So, quick question. So the procedure is just one sum is a square, and the sufficient statistic is just a covariance matrix. That one is truly parallelizable. Mm -hmm. Then the, essentially, we can just quickly calculate this d square, d by d covariance matrix. Then I mean, that's essentially what, what, what was done with the SNP data. You have a high dimension. Um, oh, okay, so now the algorithm the pointer doesn't matter. You just, sometimes it does depending on how the, the different levels of blasts are implemented, but it doesn't matter. If you just want to calculate the covariance matrix, it's right. extremely paradisable. Right? Uh, right. Then the, we don't need to worry about that very big end. And just a guy that is smaller d squared covariance matrix that feed it into whatever it is a square solver? Um, maybe. 
yeah, but you still need to compute uh, that uh, problem, and that's going to depend on it, right? The covariance matrix, but yeah. That I mean, he's talking about doing it in some sort of parallel or distributed way. So the answer is yes. I guess the question is how exactly you're going to implement that. Do you have shared memory or not? And that's what the stuff towards the end, you know, either you're in a parallel or distributed type environment. And you need to, you, if it's not shared memory, you need to aggregate resources back. And MapReduce is one way to do it. Certainly not the best for these iterative algorithms. We've, we've, the, the L1 regression on a terabyte was MapReduce. And it was harder than doing least squares because it was L1. But yeah, I mean, that's what we did. Why oh, No, just L1. L1. On the Lots. objective. Yeah. Yeah, that is a tougher. Yeah. Process. So that's the thing that we have on the terabyte in, in MapReduce, essentially. Just two questions. Just make sure making sure that all the easy things are done. So is there a deterministic sub N D squared algorithm? Is there a deterministic sub N D squared algorithm? Um to get one deterministic. Sub N D squared. Not that I know of. I mean, aside from Strassen or something like that. But not that I know. Is there a determinant? Well, it depends on what you're counting. If you're counting uh, you want operations or memory accesses, which are much more expensive than uh, yeah, you know, there's 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 certain things that you can do So that's one of these cultural disconnects. So he, he's, he's probably saying flops, but if if, if long answer. But l long answer. So, so depending on what, what you're counting, flops or, or memory accesses and so on. No. It, the, the statement of this doesn't deal with any of that. Right. Basically, how you deal, if you don't want to implement these ideas, how, whether you're going to put it in RAM or in a parallel or distributed setting, you need to start worrying about those issues. And the basic thing is take this meta algorithm, this meta procedure, and instantiate in different ways. If you're going to put it in RAM, optimize flops. If you're going to put it in parallel distributed, optimize that. Yeah, that, that I don't know. So the answer that Jim gave d doesn't address the standard RAM model vanilla flops thing. It has to do with memory access, if you couldn't hear so that. So all of these, when you say standard RAM, you're saying uh, every, uh, everything is uh, equally expensive to uh, a flop in a memory access. In that case, we wouldn't probably use these algorithms. Uh, these are especially interesting when the matrix is so big they don't fit. So yeah, we have to have the right cost model here. But one of the lessons, better cost models we need to figure out for algorithms, right? And, and I agree totally. Yeah. All right. Um, so in astronomy, the, the, the application where, where this, this, we apply this, basically um, lick indices are, are a, a set of indices. It's this frequency regime, that frequency regime. A lot of manual effort depending <coughs> on um, you know, knowing the astronomy. The question is, can you come up with them in a more sort of objective way? And the short answer is yes. Basically, you, you know, you can identify the outlying leverage scores and use a reasonable heuristic to spread the lines. And, and you can get um, something like this, that if I had the full picture, will correlate very strongly with, with the lick indices. So the old lick indices are reasonably ad hoc. When I, when I say this sort of thing, the question is, who is evaluating you? Are you sending this to some um, someplace that doesn't know anything about astronomy, or are you sending this to the Astrophysical Journal? And, and so this is in a revision. It's not just submitted. So this is sent to Astronomical or Astrophysical Journal because they're particularly interested in the downstream application and the informative reasons are roughly orthogonal to the lick indices, uh, to each other in contrast to lick indices. That's good for certain applications in astronomy potentially. It'll recover the atomic lines and, and molecular bands and so on in, in, in sort of a reasonably uh, principled way, at least uh, in the sense that the astronomers felt. So let me move on to a statistical perspective and then I'll... Michael, I'm sorry, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I, I don't what this shows is that you can use this algorithm on small data if you want to do the expensive computation, on larger data if you want to do the approximate approximation algorithm to compute the leverage scores that I'll put up in a few slides, to compute things like this that maybe no one in this room cares about, but that if this was a room full of astronomers, they'd be interested in. And we have at least one. We have at least one. Good. And was there, is, is there two? or? <laughs> All right. No, I, I guess I, I just want to make sure I understand the point, right? If, if I had a, a time is not a constraint, I can do exactly this question, I will get some result. If time is not a constraint, if I get approximated this question, should I get similar quality of results or something? And then you can tell me that running time matters. I just want to make sure. So, so from an algorithmic perspective, the non uniform structure you want in this case is the leverage scores. If, oh. if, if you're not, so approximate them or project to uniformize them. Those things are interesting because they correlate strongly with regions of the genome that are interested to geneticists. 
regions of the frequency spectrum that are interest to astronomers, regions of the brain that are interested to neuroscientists. So, exact or approximate, either. Yeah. Yes. Tailing off on that last comment you just made, uh, in the neuroscience context, I had the impression that unless I missed something, would be in the fat algorithm case, and they were n is where n is large in the hundred thousand range, and d is in the hundred to two hundred. Uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, the opposite, right? Um, because we have we have short time series, a couple hundred points, but we have a hundred thousand of them or two hundred thousand of them, and we do want to pick. Individual, so we don't want to transport that thing. What matters is which are the individual voxels that are sort of highly. So you want to sample in the small dimension. Excuse me. You want to sample in the small dimension. Yes. Yeah. So you could you could extend this, and um, I'm not going to go into the details, but basically, arbitrary m by n matrix, you need a rank parameter. Choose that. However, that's a model selection rule that so is outside the discussion we're talking about. Define the leverage scores relative to the best rank case space. That's actually the low rank thing on, in genetics. We, we didn't we didn't look at the. Uh, at, at, at 400 people in HapMap or 4,000 in the, in the extensions of that, we looked at the best rank 10 or 20 approximation. Yeah. And in the same way as the spectrum decays slowly and there's never kinks the way people sort of think about it, the leverage scores behave in complicated ways and so on. And that's, there's a bit of an art there and a bit of a practice. But yeah. All right, so let me um, briefly mention a statistical perspective. So basically what, what I've said, and it's the case, if you're interested in worst case algorithms, this, this is a structure you need to find. If you're going to do low rank approximation, you need some extensions of that structure. So Petros gave an example earlier where it had to do with the top part of the spectrum multiplied by the sampling matrix, basically by the, the pseudo inverse of the sampling matrix operating on the right singular vector. So that's a generalization of that. So some structure like that. The question is, how is this thing going to perform in practice statistically? So what we see in a lot of cases, actually, is that whether or not we need to, if we run an approximation algorithm for, say, the leverage scores, um, and we use that approximation as a proxy rather than the exact one, oftentimes you'll do better. Clearly not on the objective function, um, but you'll do better in some downstream sense, like the astronomical genetic sense, for people who don't know or care about what we're talking about. They want to use this stuff as a black box. And so why is that the case? So sort of informally, I think why that's the case is you have randomness inside the algorithm. And you're not exactly fitting to this particular data set. So you're not exactly fitting the non-uniformity structure in this data set. You're smudging it out a little bit. And that's particularly true not in the very rectangular case, but in the symmetric positive semi-definite case or, or, or just general M by N matrix where so you have a low rank parameter. So you're not fitting exactly to this data set. You're smudging it out a little bit. So you're effectively implicitly uh, folding regularization into the algorithm. So if you really drove epsilon down to the 10 to the minus 10, you're getting the, the exact answer. In fact, it's better to leave epsilon as 0.1 or even 1 and get a much coarser approximation. So can you formalize that? So um, we formalize this. This is with Pingma and Bin Yu. And I've switched to notation because you know, the hard part is figuring out that when you're talking about x, you're talking about the matrix that I was calling A before. So statisticians say uh, y is equal to x beta plus epsilon. So for the next few slides, I'm going to use that notation. But it's the same over-constrained least squares that we're, we're talking about. Um, beta ordinary least squares is the argument. That's the thing we had before. Y, I still called this h. Leverage score is still the same. Main algorithm, randomly sample. Now we're n by p. I've got, changed the d to a p. So now we're n by p. Um, using the exact or approximate lev leverage scores as the important sampling distribution. Down sample and rescale the way you heard about before. Solve the subproblem. So from a worst case sense, biasing yourself towards these non-uniformity structure, either explicitly inside the algorithm or implicitly by doing a random projection, is uniformly better than uniform sampling, just period. Right, you can very easily construct examples where uniform will just fail. How does that perform in, in practice? So let's consider uniform sampling. Let's consider sort of a vanilla version of leverage with exact leverage scores, approximate or the same, unless you do rough approximations in this particular context. And what I'll call shrinked leverage, which is roughly use the leverage scores and admix in a little bit of something, a little bit of uniform. Um, in this particular case, but you can implement that algorithmically in kernel cases just by running the approximation algorithm. And something else where I'm going to sample and not reweight. And this will be introducing bias in a certain form. So how is this going to perform? So the estimator beta, which was the x opt I had before beta, is this messy expression. The point is that there's the x matrix and there's the scaling and resampling matrix W, which depends on whether you're doing this uniformly or non-uniformly. So you get some expression there which is a little bit messy and which is going to be hard to do analysis on. So let's do essentially a Taylor expansion of this solution 
around a point. So which, around which point? And basically it's around, in this case, an all ones vector because the expectation of the relating vector is going to be around, is, is going to be one. If you don't rescale, you need to do an expansion around something else. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we'll see later that you're going to introduce a very systematic bias. And then beta for um, this omega is either uniform or leverage or approximate leverage or strength leverage or whatever, is the beta ordinary least squares plus this term plus other stuff. So it's the leading thing that you'd expect, plus some other stuff, x transpose x inverse times diagonal of E, something linear in W, which is the sampling and rescaling probabilities, plus higher order terms. And what you can show very easily is a lemma of the following form. Expectations of beta hat for any sampling process in which you do the rescaling, the way we've been talking about it so far, is going to be ordinary least squares plus something small. Now whether that's, a, that's something small or not, actually I'm going to get back to it, plus a, a, a higher order, something that you hope is a higher order term. Um, and this is conditioned on a given matrix, on a given data set. Now that's a very natural way to think about it in terms of algorithms. If you're a statistician, you might want to be thinking about this not conditional on a given data set, but the fact that I ran, I have a given model, and I instantiate the given data set a bunch of different times, because it's generated from a random process. So you might also ask, I want the result unconditional, you know, I want the expectation of variance unconditional on the data. So here you have an expectation, and you're not unbiased around the ordinary least squares estimate, you're estimated around, let's call it beta naught. This is the ground truth, right? If you have a model, you say the data is generated according to this ground truth, I get a particular snapshot of the data, and I get ordinary least squares estimate. If you condition on the data, that's what you get. If you don't condition on the data, you get the ground truth. And in both cases, you get a variance. The details of the variance terms are a little bit different. But the point is that you're going to have something x transpose x inverse and on both sides with a sandwich expression. Diagonal E's times the diagonal of something having to do with the inverse probabilities. Right? Because we needed to do the resampling. And, and when, sorry, when we did the sampling, we needed to do the rescaling earlier. And we needed to do the rescaling because we want the sampled version of u transpose u to be on the same scale as the identity. All right? If you sample 100 points out of a million, you res uniformly you rescale everything by a million over 100. This is just the non-uniform version of that. Um, and you get a slightly different, but you still have a, a sandwich expression, but you still have a sandwich expression in the unconditional case. So let's ask how these things. So uniform sampling. So it depends. The question is going to be, the, the two parameters we're going to have to play with here is 1r, the number of samples. 2 pi is going to be the probability distribution that, that you sample and or scale with respect to. So uniform, the variance is going to scale as n over r. High dimension divided by the number of samples. If you're a statistician, that's probably very familiar. If you do a leveraged estimate, the variance is going to scale as p over r. When I say scale, means you're going to have something here plus all this other stuff. But, but the leading order term, the scaling on it, is going to be either n over r. That's going to be awkward algorithm because that suggests that if you sample 50 n columns, you're going to get good results. right? And you want to be sampling n over 50 columns. The basic leverage is p over r. That's good because it suggests that if you sample p log p, low dimension log low dimension, that's going to be small. But you have 1 over the leverage scores as the ham inside your sandwich. Right? You know? And if the leverage scores are very small, you might be in trouble. That's not a problem from the worst case perspective, but from the statistical perspective, it's going to be. It turns out if you had mixed in a bit of, of uh, you, you shrink them back a little bit. You heard of shrinkage um, yesterday. Mike was talking about one particular form of it. You can get the variance to scale as p over r. And you can remove basically the one over leverage terms in the denominator. Not that you remove them, but they're all not too far from uniform. They're, one, they're no worse than one-tenth uniform. Um, you can also remove these rescalings exogenously. Just don't rescale. And you can say, how does that perform? And we'll see that that performs better or worse, depending on the question you ask. Um, if you generate matrices, the left-hand side is, is Gaussian data. Gaussian of uniform leverage scores is all the same. If you use T1 or something where there's a non-uniform distribution, the variance is on the number of samples is on the x-axis here. Variance is on the y. Bias is on the y. Straight line is leverage. Dotted line is uniform. Leverage is just better, right? So this this would be better. Now the question about losing rank is an interesting one because here in the worst case analysis you need to preserve rank. Done or you're dead, right? What's the way to measure quality here? I'm talking about bias and variance. Essentially, I'm talking about mean, you know, MSE. Right? Is that the right way to view this or not? It turns out that if you, if you try to optimize the mean squared error, the right sampling probably not the leverage scores, but are something like the row lengths. 
which is what you got the old additive error algorithms, the results that were worse from an algorithmic perspective. It's not exactly the row lengths, but the first order it's going to be the row lengths. Um, so that suggests there's going to be a trade-off between the bias and variance here, and you see that. So what we see here is the log of the variance and the log of the bias from 0 to, say, 500, and this is just zoomed in 0 to 50. The point is here that the bias is not going to be monotonic as a function of the number of samples, effectively because if you sample with the dashes uniformly, you may lose rank. If you sample with the leverage scores, you will not lose rank. Now, what do I mean by that? If, if you choose your parameters right and the x-axis is 10, if you choose 20, you know, 10 log 10 over epsilon, but if you choose 20 columns, according to the leverage distribution, you, you can show that you will not lose rank. You need to get up to o order uh, 500 with, with the uniform sampling. And I guess I took that slide out of the deck, or here it is. So the fraction of singular subproblems will be something like, um, you know, if you get uh, down, this is the proportion of singularities. If you use leveraging, the, very quickly the number of samples is going to go to zero, which is, exact, is exactly that result. But if you do it uniformly, you need to sample half the columns or something, something just much, much larger. But if you lose rank, it's not necessarily a bad thing in terms of the MSE, because if you've lost a lot of rank, you're on one or two dimensions, you're just going to have a lot less variation. So whether the MSCs are the right or, or not right way to view this from a statistical perspective is a separate question. But that's just one example illustrating sort of the subtleties that if you adopt the worst case perspective, you're going to get one set of results. From a statistical perspective, you want to bias yourself towards the leverage scores or not, you're going to get a different set of results potentially. Um, but we can use these shrink leverage scores. Algorithmically, the running time is going to be no worse because you just approximate the leverage scores and then you know, add, add a little bit of basal level of something uniform. And statistically, you're going to get better properties. And let me uh, gloss over the, um, the bias with the unweighted, just sort of in the interest of time. All right, so the statistical thing I went through quickly. Is there any sort of questions at, at a high level on that? All right, so the point there is that um, if you're going to be interested in the statistical properties, these are sort of the relevant structures, but you may get better or worse answers depending on the, worse, de depending on the questions you're asking than you would sort of from a worst case perspective. I think there's going to be a lot of questions here to say, you know, what if you want to introduce bias in a different way? What if rather than solving the subproblem that's a least squares problem, you solve a bias version of the subproblem? You might, you might get a better estimator of the original problem, right? I'm saying solve a subproblem. I'm, I'm saying construct a sketch, solve a subproblem. You may, you may solve a different subproblem and be able to introduce bias in a, in a slightly better way and play off the bias variance trade off in a better way um, than you do here. MSE is probably not the best metric to look at these things through because basically it's going to be a variance metric and you're going to gloss over a lot of the subtleties that you see here. But you can get better statistical properties in the least squares case. And I'm not going to have time to that, but you can do it also in the kernel case and other cases like that. All right, so let's talk about extending these ideas to kernels and symmetric positive semi-definite matrices. And the motivation here is going to be that you want to extract a linear structure from data, but the data might not be naively linear. So there's a lot of machinery on basically using symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, so so-called kernels, to basically extract a linear structure in an implicitly defined feature space. Um, algorithmically, you're going to get a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. This is interesting. In a lot of cases, when the matrix is reasonably well approximated by something low rank, the n squared times the rank parameter n cube computation may be uh, too expensive. Can you do something faster? So the prior work here was just very, very weak. And I know that because it was actually based on a result that I had with Petros about seven years ago, where we got additive error bounds. But it was this very, very weak additive error. It was, the additive error wasn't even the scale of the matrix. The additive error was basically the scale of the square root of the matrix. And we had this sort of sample in a very naive way. And, and the tricky part was that it wasn't clear how to preserve the symmetry and positive definiteness. There's been a lot of work following up on that. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the, you know, our result, but all the subsequent work, really was sort of sufficiently weak that it wasn't even a qualitative guide to practice. And then there's a lot of questions about is projections or sampling or this or that the right way to view it. And, and um, sometimes you'll have a data set that you do marginally better on with a projection or some version of sampling. And so we tried to take a step back and say, you know, what's going on here? Um, and this is in spite of the fact that, you know, these, these Nystrom-based methods are just used in a lot of applications and, and, you know, with some success. And there also was a lot of conflicting claims about uniform sampling versus leverage-based sampling, you know. What do real data look like? You know, are, are, is the coherence small? Is, is these things pretty non-uniform? 
Um, and, and some claim that sort of in a lot of machine learning applications, you just had low coherence. And this contrasted very, very sharply with um, the sort of proven non-uniformity of these things in genetics and astronomy and a range of other applications. It was really of interest to downstream practitioners. And um, the other reason we're revisiting this now is now there's a lot of high quality implementations that there wasn't before. So um, just to remind you, spectral Frobenius and trace norms. These are matrix norms, measure the size of the matrix um, that are related in this way. And the basic symmetric positive semi-definite sketching model will be the following. Say I have A as an n by n positive semi-definite matrix. And S is my sketching matrix. It's this thing, but I'm going to think of it as a sketching matrix. And then I'm going to call C the sample of columns from A. And W is the intersection. So you can think of S as a sampling matrix, in which case you're sampling actual columns, or a projection matrix or anything else. And the key insight here, this is with Alex Gittins, and the key insight he had was that if you work within the structure of this particular form, then effectively you're implicitly, inside the analysis, you're implicitly working on the square root of the of the original symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. So now, as long as you respect that structure, um, then you're always going to be guaranteed something of, of, of the form that's going to be symmetric and positive semi-definite, and so you can run through the analysis. And how do we do that? Well, we had to come up with results that essentially decoupled the randomness from the vector space structure in a slightly different way, and this just provided much finer control in these applications in a range of examples. So here's an example. Here's, here's sort of the basic example. So say that your A is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. U1 is the top k eigenvalues. Omega1 is the sketched version of the top k eigenvalues. And I didn't write it down, but U2 is the bottom n minus k eigenvalues, and omega2 is the bottom n minus k. So U1 and 2 is the top and bottom part of the spectrum. U is the eigenvalues. Omega is the sketched version of the eigenvalues. So this is a deterministic structural result. When C is AS, the sample of columns, or the sketch of the columns, it doesn't need to be a sample, and W is S transpose AX, then if you take your original matrix A and you approximate it with a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix, C times the pseudo inverse of W times C transpose. So this is, this is a symmetric positive semi-definite version of a CUR decomposition, if, if you know what that is. Um, and we're interested in spectral and Frobenius and trace. And you might expect that you're gonna, it's going to be harder to get good results for spectral norm than Frobenius or trace, and we'll see that in the analysis. Then you're going to be better than the best rank K. That's the best rank K approximation to A, just a different way of writing it, in spectral or Frobenius or trace, plus some other stuff. And that other stuff depends on how good the sketch is, not surprisingly. Right? That other stuff depends on how the bottom part of the spectrum talks to the top part of the spectrum, in particular talks to the inverse, of the, or pseudo inverse of the top part of the spectrum. So if this sketch was just an identity, you keep all the columns, or, or I guess I shouldn't say an identity, but, but a, the top k columns, the, the, the top k eigenvectors, then the bottom part of the spectrum, na namely this rotation I'm talking about was not a rotation, the angle was zero, then the top part of the spectrum and the bottom part of the spectrum are perpendicular, they don't talk to each other, that term is zero. The scaling here is square root of sigma versus sigma, but it wouldn't matter if they're exactly perpendicular. That term would be zero, and all those terms would drop. But if you're doing a sampling or sketching, the question is, how good is it? And the answer to how good is it is it is as good as the best, plus something that depends on how the sketch talks to the vector space structure. Assuming omega has full rank. Assuming omega 1 has full rank. For the Frobenius and spectral norm, that's I mean, they're completely perpendicular. That's true from the traditional term, right? But trace yeah. normal... Trace may be... A, yeah. So how do we guarantee that omega-1 has full rank? This is just the full rank, the full matrix version of this. To guarantee that that has low rank, you look at the leverage scores in the top k space, sample the spec to them, if S is a sampling matrix, or if S is a projection matrix, you choose the parameter right, k log k, and you guarantee that. So that assumption is automatically satisfied, assuming you set this thing up the right way. And then you have to control how these terms talk to each other. And it's not immediately obvious that those will be small, but it will turn out that they will be. All right? So this is a basic structural result. And once you have this, you can say, you know, how does the sampling and projections, you know, how do they behave? And the answer is, in, this is much, much better than the previous theory. I put up the previous theory before. But you're also at a level of granularity where 
The differences between what we, you can prove with the sampling-based methods and what you can do with the projection-based methods if you use plus minus one projections, and what you can do with the projection-based methods if you use Gaussian projections, starts to reveal more about the analysis you have on, on, on the control of those things than how the results actually would be and or how they'd perform in, in a real application. So I'll, on the next two slides, I'll give you an example of that. There's going to be various terms because we parameterize it two different ways. And the an open question is, you know, given that there's still going to be a theory practice gap, can you, can you start to improve some of those things? So say S is a sampling matrix where you sample with the exact or approximate leverage scores. Um, A minus the low rank approximate is best rank K plus epsilon times something that's large. The trace norm is larger than the spectral. For the Frobenius, um, you get 1 plus epsilon best plus epsilon times something. And for trace, you actually get relative error. If you have a projection matrix, the parameters are, you know, we parameterize it slightly differently, but it's best rank K plus something times trace, additive with scale given by trace. Best rank K plus slightly different uh, additive, but scale still given by trace. And one plus epsilon. And similar bounds for Gaussian. If you want to say, do a coherence-based analysis, you get the same sort of stuff, but you have to eat a factor of the coherence and so on and so forth. Um, so... Uh, so let me gloss over that. If anyone's interested in how the data actually look, grab me afterwards and I'll tell you because there's some subtleties there. And say, you know, before you, you had A minus the same approximation was better than best rank K plus epsilon times the sum of the diagonal entries in A, which is large. It's just pretty large. Um, Kumar and Mori and Talwalker had a result that says if you sample K log K times something that depends on the coherence columns uniformly, and if A has exactly rank K, then you can reconstruct A. And Gittins had sort of a soft version of this um, that says you can do this if the matrix is in exactly rank K, where he had spectral norm approximations that were either best rank K plus 1 times 1 plus 2N over L, which is not so good if you want L to be 1 one hundredth of N, which is what you typically want. But that's, you're going to be stuck with something large that's either multiplying the base factor or is tacked on as a relatively large um, additive scale. And, and, and we see that in our methods. Um, so let me gloss over that again and say, um, how do we approximate the leverage scores quickly? And I'm going to give you the vanilla algorithm in the, in the tall case. And the same ideas will go through um, with a few more subtleties in the case of general matrices, and in particular the symmetric positive semi-definite ones I've been talking about. So here's the algorithm. It's simpler than it looks. The algorithm is going to be basically the following. I have a matrix A. It's tall. Multiply it by, let's call it, pi is a random projection. So again, pi can be a subsampled, randomized Hadamard transform if you want to optimize flops. It can be Gaussian if you want to better communication properties. It can be, you know, whatever. But think of it if you're optimizing flops in terms of the, uh, you know, fast johnson linen trust type methods. So if you have A and you do QR on A, then I can post-multiply A by R, and I get Q. Read the row lengths off. That those are the things I want, right? Once I have that, read the row lengths off those, that's a non-uniformity structure I want. So let's look at this and let's say do QR on pi A. All right? And then let's say I do um, pi A R inverse is equal to Q. Now I have two different Qs here, so maybe I should say Q, Q tittle or something, an R tittle. So this Q is optimal for pi A, right? I get a, a good Q for pi A. But I can take this R inverse and go back here. And if I take A and look at R tittle inverse, I get a matrix Q tittle tittle. The dimensions are all right. I'm, I'm not going through the details of the dimensions. That's tall. And I can read the row norms off of that. If I want to go get one, any one leverage score that is sufficient, and if I want to get them all, I need to put a second projection there. Um, and uh, I preserve distances to 1 plus epsilon, and so I can preserve the uh, leverage scores to 1 plus epsilon, and it all goes through. So basically, do a random projection on A. Running time is random projection time. Do QR, and work with A, R inverse, multiply by a second projection. There you're projecting on the small dimension, not the large dimension. Right? Usually we project on the large dimension, but here I'm projecting on the small dimension. And I get a bunch of numbers. You have a tall matrix now, just read them off. I get a bunch of numbers, n numbers in fact. 
and those numbers are relative or approximations to the corresponding leverage scores. So I get um, L tittle I such that L tittle I, the approximation is within one plus epsilon of Li, which is defined to be this, um, you know, this quantity I had. All right, and that runs in this time, which is the n d log root d plus all these other factors. I don't know if Mutu's still here, but these are the factors he was asking about. So you know, in, in n d log d time. Um, the running time is good if you want to get into large problems um, in, in the sense that basically the running time is going to be the same as that it was for blend and pick. You know, so it'll be faster than, um, than um, LA pack for large matrices where large is very modest. So a couple hundred by a couple thousand. So very modest sense of the word large. And up. Two thousands by a billion or, or whatever um, the stuff that I was telling you in the parallel and distributed environments works. What if you, this actually gets back to the statistical perspective I was talking about. What if you, um, you know, you work in R. You don't want to get hugely large and you want to say, how does this perform? So this was when we were working. This is one piece of the um, statistical perspective I was talking about. Ping Ma did this. He's a statistician, not a numerical guy, not an algorithms guy. And I said, why don't you compute this? And he said, how? And I said, here's the vanilla version. How does it implement in R? So you should think of this as being a model for what someone that might want to do that just pulls something off the shelf, uses one of these algorithms instead of a vanilla form, not a very sophisticated and high quality numerical implementation. And here we're n by p again. So fix p to be whatever the size is. The sample size n goes from I think P was 2,000 or something. The sample size N goes from something up to 60 or 70,000. Fix N to be, I think it was 20,000, and the small dimension went from a couple hundred to 5,000. And let's say that we do this projection, wherever I have the projection, this projection right here. And don't even be smart about it. Don't do the fast Hadamard-based things, but do a plus minus one random projection, and do a Gaussian projection. And even be sloppy, and don't do this second projection. So do something here that's not fast in terms of flops. This gets to Jim's point. Jim left, but this gets to Jim's point. This isn't going to be faster in terms of flops. We're not going to do the second projection there to be better in theory. And what we see is the following. Call QR, try and solve the least square sub problem. This is the running time on one of the figures that I glossed over a few minutes ago. And what you see, the algorithm behaves this way. It's linear in, in the dimension n. And it's slightly worse. Gets b fast and g fast to the binary and Gaussian. And exact is the, the two types of random projections. The, the dark line is the exact. A little bit faster gets a little bit slower. So you know you're 20% faster. So that's good or not, depending on whether you care about these things. But you can get from 35,000 up to 60,000. So 60,000 is large in a modest sense of the word. But you can get almost a factor of two larger. Similarly, on the predictor size P, N was, as I said, I think 20,000. This, you can get the small dimension with the exact algorithm up to about, whatever that is, 3,500. You can get up to about 5,000 or a little bit larger with the projection algorithms. Just a fairly straightforward implementation. So here you're not a lot faster, but you can get larger. So why is that? And, you know, the answer is we're not doing anything fancy here. We're doing matrix vector multiplication solving a subproblem. So we're not doing QR on a large problem of size 20,000 by 40, 2,000 by 40,000 or whatever. We're just doing a vanilla type random projection, matrix vector multiply, go to a smaller prob solve problem, memory access, and so on, to Jim's point, that meshes much better with uh, these sorts of memory access issues, so we can get quite a bit larger. Um, so let me tell you about implementing these ideas in large scale settings. And time is tight that I'm not going to spend 10 minutes on it, I'll just spend one or two. The short answer is do the same idea, but don't worry about flops. Worry about communication. All right? So do your random sampling or random projection algorithm. Don't do Hadamard or something like that. Do Gaussians. All right, Gaussians are trivial to parallelize. You can do it in a in shared memory or not shared memory environment. Multiple cores or not in your data center. Um, get a sketch. Gaussians actually have the advantage over the plus minus ones, Rademacher if you like the, the fancy names, but plus minus one variables. And they, they have better symmetry properties, and so you're going to get better results on the condition number. All right? So do, an, uh, uh, do a projection like that, and then either solve the subproblem or call an iterative algorithm. Um, so 
Large can mean different things to different people. Shared memory, memory pa passing, map reduced, distributed computing. I'll give you the one minute summary of LSRN, which is the, think of that as the parallel version of blend and pick. And, um, and then the one minute summary of how to extend the ideas to L1. Um, the idea is generate a Gaussian matrix. Let um, compute your R inverse like we talked about before, and call some iterative algorithm. What iterative algorithm? You can call um, a conjugate gradient based method. Requires lots of dot products, but it's not so bad and ran pretty good actually. Or you can dust off your textbooks, which I had actually seen this, but I'd forgotten about this, and use something called the Chebyshev semi iterative method. Different iterative method. If you know about iterative methods, you know, there's dozens that are based on this, and this is sort of an outlier. This actually does pretty well if you have a guarantee on the condition number which you very, very rarely do. And so since all the <coughs> scientific computing code and numerical linear algebra code, the driver on that is scientific computing. When you don't have bounds on condition numbers, a lot less work done here than there. This requires lots of dot products. That doesn't. This will always chug and give you an answer. This will fail terribly if your bound on condition number is not correct. Do a Gaussian projection. Guaranteed you have good results on the condition number. If you have good results on condition number, Call this. Don't need all these dot products. So what you need is, here's the relevant snippet code, um, LSQR. If you're going to do the matrix vector multiplication per, per iteration, you're going to get two matrix vector multiplications, right? So we do the random projection, get the conditioning basis, and we're iterating now. How much communication is there? There's going to be two cluster-wide synchronizations if we're going to do LSQR, which is the, the, the sort of state-of-the-art conjugate gradient-based method for least squares. If you're going to do Chebyshev semi-iterative, I guess my color coding is messed up here, but you have an all reduce, all reduce, two cluster wide synchronizations. Here you're just going to have all one. One cluster wide synchronization. So instantiate the same idea we've been talking about with sampling and projections, but worry about communication. Don't worry about flops. Um, if you want the um, two word summary of how all these ideas for least squares regression generalizes to things like L1 or quantile regression, um, the two words are, it does. The, the three word summary after hundreds of pages of math and so on by us and a lot of other people is, it does messily. So it's much, much messier. Um, L1's not as nice a place as L2. You don't have unitary invariance. The condition number properties are worse. You don't call conjugate gradient. If you want to do iterations, you need to call something else. What do you call? We actually had to use a randomized interior point cutting plane method to get the L1 regression to work on, on the terabyte of data. Not, not simplex, not interior point, not nothing like that. An algorithm that was much more expensive per iteration, but required many few iterations. So much better on communication properties. You put it in MapReduce, we could do a factor of 100 more computation with 1.1 more time. So 10%, not a factor of 10, you know. 280 versus 310 seconds, we could do a factor of 100 more computation. Um, Theory and practice of input sparsity regression algorithms. Matrix multiplication results, some of those generalize if you have input sparsity, that's something my student John William Mang had. And you can use that to get good results on, um, on the embedding for, for low rank problems and a range of other things. If you're of an algorithms background, you know about the Clarkson Woodruff result. They had a 10 page, 15 page analysis. They split the, sub, the space up into heavy hitters and light hitters, lots, use lots of ideas for data, from data streaming and so on. Strangery came to me and said, how is this result even possible? I said, I don't know, it's a good result. It'll actually be an important result. Um, but he, and he said, you know, I can't understand this stuff. Is there a simpler way? I said, I don't know, you might be, we might be able to do something more directly. He came back, one page. Check a couple moments, done. We have their results. Much, much cleaner. And it boils down to that matrix multiplication result. And there's trade-offs there between running time and condition number quality. If you optimize running time, you typically going to be a trade-off and you're going to be worse on condition numbers. That's fine if you want low precision, but if you're going to feed this to an iterative algorithm, typically you don't want to do that. You don't want the best results on condition numbers, because if you optimize to that, you're going to do worse. So you want to be suboptimal by both methods, which is one of the tricky things, right? If you want to be best by this measure or that, the results that actually work you know, aren't. They're, uh, they're slightly suboptimal by each of those measures. So conclusions to part two. Least squares regression. Faster sampling in theory and practice. Statistical perspective. You can get better practical results without sacrificing worst case quality by, by considering biases and variances. Um, 
the results here are interesting, took a lot of work, and I think it opens up the door for a lot of other interesting questions more generally than just the L2 case, since the L2 is so structured from a statistical perspective. So um, revisiting the nicer methods, the devils in the details, lots of sort of systems type issues where you need to worry about the data and various things, and I glossed over those. Implementing these ideas in parallel and distributed. A lot of the same meta-algorithms work, but don't over-optimize to the traditional metrics. Lots of future directions, and I think it's coffee break time, so to wrap up, Lots of very large modern massive data sets are well modeled by matrices. Existing algorithms, both on the theory side and on the implementation side, were developed for other reasons. Scientific computing, small scale data analysis, whatever. Randomization is a powerful tool for lots of things in algorithms, discrete algorithms, also in matrix, in, in matrix computations. And I think it's a great sort of model of proof, aside from being interesting in its own right in a lot of the questions we've raised in future directions, a nice model of proof of principle for sort of bridging the gap between algorithmic perspectives um, and statistical perspectives in terms of uh, bridging the gap between the two to do more principled, much larger scale um, analytics. So with that, I think uh, I'll wrap up. Unless there are no burning questions, why don't we go to take a break, catch Michael during the break. Um, if you are thinking of wandering away because it's a beautiful day in Berkeley, it's always a beautiful day in Berkeley. So any other day. And if there's one topic that's even more important for our field than our general topic, uh, then matrices might be optimization. So we're going to start optimization, a key topic after the break. Don't go away. Come back in 30 minutes. So, Mike, sorry, one reminder. Mike announced that. Please don't bring food or drinks into the hall. I'm saying that preemptively before the next session, rather than the beginning of the next session. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Every time I see you, I give you one of the I don't know how to have one, but I want to.